Okay, so now we're recording. So thanks to everyone for joining us for our third and final part of our virtual audio described Missouri Botanical Garden series. My name is Megan Harms and I'm the Arts and Culture Coordinator for Mind's Eye. This event was made possible with funding in part from the Arts and Education Council. And I will be sending out a survey. I know I've said this every week um, and I haven't sent a survey, but I will be sending out a survey this week after this final one. Um, and this survey information is really important for our funders to know that we are making an impact. This, this survey is also, this is an anonymous survey and it goes directly to our funders. It's not um, going to us, it's going to our funders. And before we begin, as usual, we want to acknowledge that Mind's Eye is located in Belleville, Illinois, the ancestral lands of many people, including the tribes commonly known as the Sioux, Quapaw, Miami, Osage, Kaskaskia, and Kickapoo. We also acknowledge those tribes who pass near our area during their forced removal, including the Cherokee, Delaware, Sac and Fox, and Shawnee. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people of this land before us. And uh, thanks again to everyone for joining us. And I will, we've, we've been talking with Tom, but Tom, give us a quick hello so we know you're here. Hello, everybody. Oh, let me let in Rita from our waiting room. Hi, Rita. Hey there. We're we just getting started. Oh, yay. We haven't, we haven't started the video yet. Yay. So actually, right now, I'm going to start my screen share. And this video is about 20 minutes long. Let me, and here we go. And let me know if you need it to be uh, louder or anything. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Chu, Horticulture Supervisor of the Japanese Garden and South Gardens. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the Tea House Island and of the uh, Tea House. Audio description provided by Mind's Eye. Black and white bird's eye view, titled Tea House Island, hosted by Ben Chu. Our first, uh, our beginning of our journey will begin by crossing what we call the Earthen Bridge. Uh, that's behind me. The Earthen Bridge is uh, uh, suggests a movement from uh, an outside environment to a more inner environment or more, ur more urban environment to a rural environment. So you'll have earthen bridges or natural stone bridges. Those types of bridges are suggestive of that sort of transition from one environment to another. Earthen bridges typically are uh, logs laid over a bridge support there's a clay that would be packed onto the surface of the bridge and then a growing medium on top of that where you would grow either uh, some sort of ground cover or turf grass. Um, in our situation here, this is concrete, so it will be able, it can withstand um, a lot of foot traffic over, over time. Thin patches of yellow and green grasses grow along both sides of the narrow railless bridge. One of the features that we will see as we cross the earthen bridge is a snow viewing lantern that is uh, placed at the edge of the island. This particular lantern is uh, uh, characterized by its umbrella shaped cap uh, set over the, the firebox. Uh, normally these types of lanterns you would find along a water's edge. This particular lantern was a gift to the city of St. Louis from our sister city in Japan, Suwa. Uh, craftsmen carved it uh, in Japan. It was shipped here and uh, set in place by the, the craftsmen who were part of that project. The low stone lantern stands on a flat rock at water's edge with legs in a rainbow shape holding the windowed box under the umbrella top. As we make our way to the tea house, we'll travel along uh, some stepping stones placed into the landscape. Uh, stepping stones uh, came to the Japanese garden landscape during the 12th, between the 12th and 13th century, 14th century, when tea ceremonies became more popular in the, uh, in the culture. Uh, stepping stones were meant as a way to convey the guests from point A to point B from uh, outside the garden uh, to uh, through the, um, what we call the tea garden up to the tea house. Stepping stones were meant as a way to keep your 
feet from getting wet and free from mud. Also, the stepping stones act as a means by which uh, it would slow the pace of the guests to the tea house. Uh, stepping stones also are a little uneven, so that it is necessary for one to be conscious of their uh, where they're stepping, where they uh, where uh, each foot will fall before proceeding on to the next, and that just brings you to um, the ability of the stepping stones to make you more conscious, more aware, more in tune with your environment. Uh, some of the stepping stones uh, are set in a way so that when you uh, pause on them, you're able to see a full amount of the, the landscape. This is intentional by the, by the designer to place a, a, a what's called a, a, a viewing stone or a path dividing stone, which is what I'm standing on right now. This particular stone is, is set in a place so that as you stop and pause and look around at the landscape, you're looking at a, a view that the designer felt was very uh, unique or important to him. Looking down from above, grass grows close around the flat stones of different shapes and sizes. The landscape that we are walking through towards the tea house is called a roji or a, a dewy path. The idea of this landscape is that it is meant to be present a, a composition of, of plantings that is going to be harmonious and calming so that as you're walking towards the tea house, you can begin to calm yourself, ease your mind, prepare yourself to participate in the tea ceremony. The landscape is, the composition of the landscape is intended to be much more um, uh, a stylized, uh, naturalistic environment or naturalistic landscape. Flying over the island, the water looks dark and the grass bright green with trees and shrubs forming perfect geometric shapes. As we approach the tea house, we're going to walk through a, a corridor of bamboo and through a series of courtyards. The idea of this little alleyway is to create a more enclosure and also uh, provides a much more of a sense of uh, separation from the outside world. Uh, compared to the inner world of the, of the tea house and of the tea ceremony. The hedge is sheared and pruned so that it creates a wall on either side. Trees are pruned in such a way so that there also uh, provides a, an overhead, a ceiling to you as you walk through. So you're fully uh, embraced by the landscape as you're walking towards the, towards the tea house. The bamboo is close on both sides, like walls that reach over his head. The first of the series of courtyards is the outer courtyard. The idea of this courtyard is that uh, one is to stop and appreciate the landscape that is presented to you. Uh, this courtyard is uh, pretty much bathed in sunlight throughout the day. And you'll see as we uh, uh, move, transition between this courtyard and the next series of courtyards, how the exposure will change uh, uh, and the mood will change as you move from this area to, to the next. The tall bamboo creates a rectangle with open space in the center with low shrubs. As we leave the outer courtyard, we're gonna transition into a middle courtyard and that uh, movement will be, be through a, a gate that's covered but yet has no uh, actual fencing on either side. The idea of the gate is not so much to keep people out, but to suggest a movement from uh, the outside world to the inner world of the, of the tea ceremony. The gate is a lintel, a horizontal roof over vertical supports with two wooden doors that swing in. As we pass through the set of gates into the middle courtyard, we'll follow the stepping stone path that's laid out for us and about midway along that travel, you'll encounter an offset paving that's uh, totally different than the material of the, of the stepping stone and also has a little bit of a, a jog in the, in the path. Again, this is a, a type of pavement that's used to uh, make you aware, draw your attention back to the, the present and your surroundings. Two long sections are made up of several dozen small flat stones with bamboo on each side. So now we've uh, reached the uh, tea house. The tea house is a style of tea house called the Soan style tea house. It's a, which means farmhouse style tea house. Uh, this is uh, fashioned after many uh, farmhouses that you might see in the countryside of Japan. 
Uh, above the, this lower roof is a, a plaque. That plaque says Nagano On, which is the little house of Nagano. This particular tea house was a gift to the state of Missouri from Nagano Prefecture. Uh, it was built in Japan, uh, dismantled, shipped over here, and reassembled by a, a group of craftsmen from Matsumoto City. And they re, uh, uh, reassembled it here on site. After uh, its completion, it was, uh, uh, the tea house was blessed with the Shinto ceremony. The lower roof has wooden shingles and angles down slightly. Uh, the tea house is a natural structure, uh, does not use any uh, paint to derive uh, its color, and there are no uh, materials used to uh, uh, preserve the materials uh, used in its construction. Most of the material that is utilized is allowed to weather naturally, age, and develop a, a patina of its own, which is considered a more natural um, look and a much more um, um, uh, harmonious uh, look to the structure. The roof is shaped like a letter L with the patinaed blue tiles facing one way on one side and then the other. The interior of the, of the tea house is uh, all natural materials as well. The coatings on the wall are a, a mixture of uh, um, a clay and sand and, and uh, pulverized straw and that's applied over the surface of the tea house. The um, uh, tatami mats, those are made out of uh, straw, rice straw, and uh, these are about um, two inches in thickness. And there are, they're made up of uh, the stems of the plant that are laid alternately over each other, and then they're sewn together. And then a finer, more high quality straw is used to cover the surface. Each of these mats is, uh, is about 60 pounds, so they're, they're really quite substantial, quite heavy. These were actually made, um, this is a second set, that was, and it was made by a family in San Francisco whose family had been involved in, in making uh, tatami mats for uh, a, num a number of generations. Um, the uh, alcove in the back where the scroll is hanging on the wall is called the tokonoma. Uh, that that uh, typically during a, a tea ceremony, one will have either a, a, a calligraphy hanging in the alcove, or perhaps a uh, a, a a painting or a, a, an ink wash, something that uh, suggests or uh, the represents the the season and the occasion for the the gathering of the tea uh, for tea ceremony. Uh, the vase would have a, a floral arrangement, a, a, a chabana. There's a a school of flower arrangement that is specific to, to tea ceremony, and that's called chabana. Um, and normally there would be a, 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 a calligraphy or a, a flower arrangement in that in that vase. That uh, particular calligraphy on the on the wall is uh, ichigo ichie, which means one opportunity, one chance, um, so that everyone recognizes the the fact that uh, we only go through. Uh, each moment in time one, once, and it's never, you never regain that moment. So you have to make, um, uh, fully uh, take, take use of the, the situation when you're in it. A long white scroll with black calligraphy hangs down the center of a beige wall. This particular uh, post on the left of the tokonoma, the alco, is actually a, a piece of uh, Zelkova wood. Uh, in Japan, uh, because of the limited land mass that they have, a lot of the uh, uh, timber is stored underwater. That particular piece was underwater and was debarked after it was uh, 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 brought up from under the water and it exhibited this uh, model appearance and is, was felt to be very attractive, so they used it as part of the tea house. The one piece to the left of that is actually a piece of cryptomeria. Cryptomeria being a very important uh, forest and timber uh, tree in Japan. Also many older specimens of uh, cryptomeria are considered uh, sacred in, in, in Japan. The exterior walls of the structure are the same neutral tones as those inside. A window is slatted with bamboo. As a guest of a tea ceremony, one would uh, 
come to the garden and would be asked to wait across uh, the lake before coming on to Tea House Island. And you would wait at what we have as the Plum Viewing Arbor as um, a place to sort of cool yourself and take pause before you're asked to come over to Tea House Island. As you come over to Tea House Island, again, you will come to an area where one would pause. You'll see this little waiting structure here, which is attached to the tea house. You would come here, you would uh, sit on this bench, you would take an opportunity to enjoy the, the shade, uh, maybe take a little bit of water and appreciate the landscape that's, that's around you. This part of the structure is similar in shape to a bus stop with an overhang over the bench and a narrow side wall. He kneels at a basin. After you have had a sufficient amount of time to uh, cool yourself in the, in the waiting arbor and you're invited to uh, enter the, the tea house, you would move along the stepping stone paths over to the, the water basin that is always associated with, with the tea house. You'll typically always have a, a, a basin nearby. Uh, basins along with the stepping stone paths and lanterns that were introduced uh, as part of the, the tea culture. Uh, this particular type of basin is called a, a kneeling uh, water basin. And from this basin, what you'll do is you'll, you'll take the ladle, you'll, you'll draw water from, uh, with the ladle, you'll place it in your hand, wash your hands, and then pour water in your hand and take into your mouth and rinse your mouth uh, as a suggesting purification of, uh, of your mind and your heart to prepare uh, your way to, to the, the tea ceremony. Uh, this particular arrangement of stones is pretty much uh, uh, exact to almost all these types of basins associated with tea ceremonies. One will typically always be a, a higher stone, which will be where uh, the, the uh, student or the, uh, the assistant will place a lantern. And then the other uh, stone lower in elevation is where the, the pot will be placed to gather water aside from being a, a place where the guests will take water. This is also uh, water that would be utilized for the tea ceremony. So a uh, lantern on one stone, the higher stone, uh, a kettle on the, on the lower stone, and then water is taken from the basin and uh, placed into that kettle and then utilized in the, in the tea ceremony. Water trickles down from a bamboo pipe into the basin. A stone lantern stands nearby. He kneels at a small door. After you've taken your uh, moment at the uh, water basin, you'll come to this this smaller lower uh, door of the of the tea house. This is the usual uh, means by which you'll enter the tea house. Uh, the reason this door is so uh, low and so small is that it places you in a a, a bowed position, uh, in a humble position before you enter the enter the into the tea house. In the the tea room, once you entered into the tea room, you were all um, at the same elevation, at the same level, so that anyone can uh, enter the tea room and be equal to all those that are inside the, uh, the, the tea room. Um, the low elevation of the, 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 this opening it was once said that uh, it was a means by which it would prevent samurai from bringing their swords into the into the tea house. During the time that tea ceremonies were was uh, taken up by the the samurai class, there were actually racks outside the the tea rooms, tea houses where swords were were meant to be placed. Ben sits in the tea house on the natural colored mats that line the floor, with his shoes removed. This is a. a uh, typical utensils that you would find in a tea ceremony. Uh, this is the brazier. This is where the, the water is heated. Um, and the, once the water is heated, it's taken from there and it's placed into this little pot right here. This is where the hot water will go, the ceramic pot. Once that's transferred to that, then they would go to the, uh, pick up the, the tea scoop, remove the tea from the, the tea carrier. You see how this is a, uh, um, has like um, it's like bamboo on the top of it, but that's going to be taken from the the uh, uh, the tea 
carrier with the bamboo scoop and placed into the, the tea bowl. Often that's accompanied by, you would often hear the, the sound of the scoop as it's tapped on the, on the, on the tea bowl. So once that, that is, uh, the tea is placed in there, then the tea master would take the, uh, um, the lid of the, the hot water jar, take the, the ladle, remove uh, just the right amount of water and pour it into uh, the, the tea bowl. Once the, the water is added, that's also uh, wiped off and uh, placed onto, the, onto the, uh, the ladle rest. Once, the, once the, the water has been added to the bowl that already has the, the uh, powdered tea in it, then it's, uh, this bamboo whisk is used to whisk the, um, the, the tea and the water mixture until it has a, a perfect, in, in the mind of the tea master, the perfect amount of foam on the, on the surface. Once that's done, then the, the tea master will give it to either the, the first guest or to an assistant who will give it to give it to the, the, the each of the guests in the room. What would happen is that the tea master would select a bowl, the the uh, the best face of the bowl, and turn it so that that uh, face is uh, pointing outwards and towards the the assistant or to towards the guest. Once the, the uh, guest accepts the, the, the bowl, uh, he admires the, the, the bowl and its unique characteristics. Uh, they'll drink from that bowl, turn it back around so the face is outward and place it onto the, onto the mat. And um, uh, typically they'll, they'll say thank you, arigato gozaimasu for the, for the tea. And then uh, the next bowl would be made and it would go around the room. A wooden footbridge arches over the water. Ben stands outside the wooden gate. I hope you all have had, uh, enjoyed uh, this experience, the virtual tour of the, uh, the Tea House Island and the, the Tea House. Um, often I'm asked about uh, the, uh, uh, the reason it's closed to the public on a, on a regular basis. And the reason being is that this is a, a very secluded area, number one. Uh, it's a very small in space, not a lot of uh, room to accommodate uh, lots of crowds. Uh, it's a, a delicate structure uh, that's made from traditional materials and requires uh, craftsmen using uh, traditional uh, techniques to, to maintain it. Uh, it's also um, a gift from Nagano Prefecture to uh, the state of Missouri and we try our best to try to, to maintain it uh, as well as possible. The tea house stands in the shade, the sun shining through the trees behind it. We hope you enjoyed this audio described behind the scenes tours of the tea house island at the Missouri Botanical Garden provided by Mind's Eye. Okay, so there are, I just realized when I closed that there were two people in the waiting room. So hopefully they weren't in the waiting room all that long. I'm sorry if you're in there. I couldn't see that until now. So hopefully they're still there. Um, so welcome everyone. <laughs> so let me go ahead and introduce Tom officially. Um, Tom Bush was raised in St. Louis. He practiced electrical engineering for approximately 25 years at Emerson Electric. He then spent 15 years teaching engineering at WashU in St. Louis. Tom has volunteered at the Missouri Botanical Garden for the last 11 years. As a docent, Tom is always excited to share his love of the Missouri Botanical Garden with visitors and garden members. Welcome, Tom. We're glad to have you. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, that was me dinging the, the Cardinal game is starting. So that okay. was what that ding was, sorry. I got you. So um, does anybody, first, does anybody have any questions to start off with? Yes. Yes. In, inside the tea room, how many people can you sit inside there? Ah, uh, um, so, 
think about the tea houses being pretty small. Um, so Ben talked about these mats, these tatami mats, tatami mats, yeah, and and they are rectangular in shape. And <clears throat> my recollection is that they're about three feet by six feet. And so this room is measured by the number of mats that it can hold. So it's called a four and a half mat room. So that would make it about 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, so it's pretty small. So I, you know, so by the time you put the tea master in the room and the, and the assistant, um, I think maybe five people uh, could attend the tea ceremony. And it doesn't sound like much, but I think it's pretty typical. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes. Good, good. Questions? Anyone else? I, I wanted to describe one thing again. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with really how tall and dense bamboo is, how close how close it goes together, and what that that looks like and seems like. It really does look like walls because there's so much of it and it's so close together. And if you are familiar, if any of you are Harry Potter fans, um, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire were in the, when they're in the maze, I'm not sure how that is described in the movie, but the idea is that they can't see anything out. And that is exactly what it looked like when Ben was in that. It, it was several feet up taller than him um, so it was, it's really enclosed. It really, it's not like there's just some trees or some plants around you that are tall. It's really a thick structure. Yeah, I mean, I think you want to think about, the, Ben was describing that whole journey across the earth and bridge and down these stones, which are kind of rough and difficult to walk on. And then, and then you make a right turn into this a corridor with bamboo on each side and every step of the way you are making a transition. So you're transitioning over the bridge, you're walking from stone to stone, you're walking through this corridor and you're going through a kind of an open space with the sun shining and then it becomes more and more intimate. You go through a uh, this um, gate and the path becomes more difficult. All of a sudden the path ends and you have to step to your right to get onto a new path. So every step of the way you're, you're making this transition from where your mind was when you started the journey to where they're trying to lead your mind at the start of the tea ceremony. So it's a tight, it's a tight walk through that bamboo hallway. Yeah, hallway is actually, that's, that's even better than that's a good descriptor there a hallway because it is very it seems very close now and i'm just going by the picture i haven't actually yeah. walked down it. no it is it's probably only two and a half feet wide or something like that and bamboo is one of the fastest growing plants on the planet you know it's tall oh. rita you have a I, question yes um the uh, I've always got questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation. Fascinating. Uh, do do they um, uh, allow for reservations for this tea ceremony, or do they ever offer it to groups to participate in this tea ceremony, this ritual? Well, so. My smart aleck answer is if you donated a million dollars to your garden, you, you would get a tour, Rita. But, uh, the real answer is that it, it is very small out there um, and it is delicate and we get a million visitors a year to the garden. And so we cannot, and, and, and it's also a bit of a sacred place. When it was built, it, it was, um, consecrated by a Shinto ceremony by Shinto priests. So it's kind of different than the rest of the garden. But setting all that aside, if we let a million people traipse through there every year, oh, yeah. just wow. for the last, and they used to have tea ceremonies at, I mean, by reservation during the Japanese festival. And they just decided they can't, you know, if, if you only can fit five people in there, you know, and the tea ceremony lasts, let's say it lasts for half an hour, you know, and 
you have 40,000 people come down for the Japanese festival, you can just see that you cannot accommodate very many people. So what they do now is they have a tour of Tea House Island about once every hour. Um, it, you have to buy a ticket. It's not terribly expensive, I think $5. But the problem is that it's very limited. So you kind of have to be there ready to buy your ticket, you know, um, pretty quickly because tickets go very fast. So like, you know, open to the public during the Japanese festival, but still difficult to get a ticket. Mm, got it. Okay. So, 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 so it's, so it's neat that, that, that you were able to take this virtual tour tonight because not many people get to go out there. Do they yeah. sometimes, do they actually use it like for diplomatic purposes for, I don't know where I read this, that, like for actual tea ceremonies, like if someone important is in the city, that sort of thing? Not that I'm aware. They used to have tea ceremonies. Um, there's um, a gentleman in town uh, who is, uh, you know, a tea ceremony master, and he used to perform tea ceremonies. Um, but I'm not. I don't know that they. I'm sure. <clears throat> you know. So one time we had the emperor and empress of Japan visit the garden. So I'm sure if somebody like that or the ambassador from Japan came, they would do it. But um, no, I don't, I'm not aware that tea fair, that, that, that it's really used much anymore other than for, um, than for what it is to, to, to make people aware of, of what goes into um, the structure and, and the, the whole mind journey that goes on as you go out there and, and the whole I don't know the whole shtick of the of the tea ceremony, which I think that, you know a lot of people struggle to think. Well, why would you even want to? What's the big deal? I made tea this morning in my kitchen, and it took you know 30 seconds. Why? Why do they drag this thing out and, and on and on? But I, I think you know the big issue is that we are so westernized that to try and shift your brain to an Eastern culture is. It's difficult, you know. Why would you do that? Why would you make such a big deal out of arranging flowers? Why is calligraphy, you know? It's, it's just, it's it's a different culture, and and um, it's very it's very interesting. Well, so focusing on the journey. Yeah. Well, the journey to the tea ceremony, and then there's the whole tea ceremony. But the tea ceremony is just kind of like a red herring. Um, I have a friend who's a machinist and he said, you know, when I'm doing machine work and I'm really aware of what I'm doing and my mind's not drifting off to the argument I have with my son this morning over breakfast, I'm really dug into this machine work, um, all the world's problems kind of go away. So you can kind of think of this tea ceremony as taking something as simple as making tea and being, and, 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 and being so um, aware of what is going on that that, that the, this this moment is is the only moment of your life and, and all the other problems that you might think you have literally do not exist at this moment. That's kind of kind of where it's going. I mean, it, it could be a nail driving ceremony, you know. Um, for, for Tiger Woods, you know, he was raised as a Buddhist and a lot of people think he was such a good golfer because, you know, he, he hit his shot and then he'd forget about it and he would walk up to the ball and he would concentrate on that shot and then he'd hit it and then he'd forget about it and then he'd, he'd just keep moving on. He wouldn't keep thinking about the, the bad shot he hit two holes ago and how that might lose the tournament for him. Yeah, when I was watching the the video with the um the the mindfulness, just just you guys can kind of get a better idea of the terrain really changes a lot. And he mentioned that in the video, you know, there's and in some of the description. Um, but when I was watching, I was like, man, this would be this would be kind of a nightmare if you had people with accessibility issues or people that are. I was actually thinking of a white cane. I was thinking because you're going from different surfaces 
and all those stepping stones they're they're the stepping stones themselves were flat they're all different sizes and there's grass in between them and they're different width and then when you move into that area where he said there was that little jog that little zigzag that was a totally different texture a totally different thing and it's a small space between two bamboo rows and it's all about the mindfulness so my first thought, even though my first thought was what a nightmare this would be to take someone through, my second thought was actually how great would this be to take someone through using a white cane because you would really, both the, everyone would have to be really aware and really mindful. And that's the whole point, right? Of going yeah. to, to mm -hmm. making this journey. So it, it did change my mind of, oh, geez, this is an accessibility nightmare to wait, this is exactly what this is built for. It's built for mindfulness. It's, so. It is. It's, it's the whole Japanese garden. You don't have to go to the tea house to encounter that those types of, of surfaces. I mean, you know, there's, I mean, OSHA would have a fit going down. I mean, there's no handrails on the bridges. You can turn your ankle at any point. At any point, um, every time, you know, there's this thing called the zigzag bridge. You see kids falling in the water because they're not paying attention to what's going on in, in, at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, if you come down and visit, um, make sure and get a dose and, and go on a tour and they'd be happy to show, you know, it's the first thing that happens when you walk into the Japanese garden is the surface changes from concrete to flagstones and you can just feel it under your feet and all of a sudden your mind just snaps back and you know you're in a special place. Mm -hmm. um, and then it does go back to, to concrete, but for the first 30 feet, they do, the, the designer did that to just force you to be aware of, not force you, but, but to help you be aware of, of where you are at, in this particular moment. Mm -hmm. Question about the tea, uh, the tea master um, and the type of tea they use. Is it, do you know, uh, does it come from Japan? And yeah. I, I know it's a whole uh, process with this tea master preparing it. Yeah, you do know? you drink tea, Rita? Yes, I do. Okay, and what kind of tea? I, I use a, a, like a loose leaf, uh, yeah. tea um, and I let it sit and then strain it. Okay. Um, so I and, and you strain out the tea leaf, right? Yes. Okay. So the tea they use is called matcha and it is um, it is a real green color and the leaves have been pulverized so they're like talcum powder. Mm. And um, so the hot water goes in with this matcha tea, and then the tea master takes a whisk, just like you whisk, I don't know, if you're scrambling eggs or something mm -hmm. like that. And he, he whisks it and whisks it, and it becomes very frothy. And then he gives it to um, one of his guests, and they drink the tea. They, the, um, and they actually drink the tea leaves. Um, they're so fine and so powdery that, that that's that's part of the tea. They, I don't even know if you could strain them out there so little, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm a tea drinker too. And so my, my tea kettle has this strainer built in and you know, the tea leaves filter out real easily, but this, this doesn't work that yep. way. Um, they don't even, they don't even attempt to. They, it's just, so just think of taking your tea, um, squishing those leaves up, that dry loose tea and, and into a powder, putting them into a bowl and adding hot water and whisking it up and, and just drinking the whole thing. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, it's interesting. It is, it's very interesting. That that does explain, I was a little confused how it was getting frothy. I mean, I understood he was using a whisk and he said yeah. powder and it was getting frothy, but I still didn't understand like how is tea getting frothy? With yeah. this? So that yeah. makes some sense. It wasn't a bag of Lipton. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm told it's expensive. I, I, I've, I've never tasted it. Um, I probably wouldn't like it because I'm just used to drinking my English breakfast tea, you know. But mm -hmm. <laughs> this is different, and you know, a, you know, tea. Uh, I think originally came from China, 
course, you know, now it's grown in India and all over the place, but uh, I don't, you know, tea came to Japan from China because through the Buddhist, you know, they, they meditation. I don't know if any of you have a meditation practice, but sometimes, you know, they meditate for a long time, hours and hours and hours, you know, and hard to keep your eyes open sometimes, you know, um, keep from falling asleep. So a little caffeine was just the thing they needed. And um, so the monks would, would drink tea to get a little shot of caffeine. And next thing you know, they've kind of turned it into a, a tea ceremony, which is a very mindfulness exercise. Um, and actually, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you mentioned meditation, Tom. That is actually one thing that we are looking at at Mind's Eye is doing some sort of virtual um, meditation yeah. coming up. So that's that's on our list of things to try along with yoga. That's, we're looking for, for yoga classes as well. Well, I try and meditate every morning. It is a tough, it is very difficult thing to do. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we are at 6.46. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we let Tom go? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I enjoyed meeting all of you and, and uh, I hope you come down the garden and I think, uh, you know, when it opens back up, I don't, I don't know when tours are going to start again, but um, tours are free and, you know, typically they have one at 11 and at one o'clock and you're always welcome to latch on to a tour and come down and enjoy yourself. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. I, I do want to remind you guys again that I'll be sending out a survey, which will also be on the YouTube link. So I will send out this video and I will also post it on our YouTube channel at the Mind's Eye YouTube channel. So anyone that's watching it on YouTube, if you're watching this video on YouTube, check out that link that has the survey <laughs> below. Check that out. And also, before we go, I want to remind everybody that we have a ton of audio description events coming up um, in this, especially June. So we have 11 dates with Opera Theater of St. Louis in June at Webster um, in outdoors. It's at the parking lot. And if you think you aren't interested in opera, please open your mind, Ooh. open your mind because you might be, and actually all of their productions are in English. Um, so that's a, a great way to try it out. And they're all actually this season, they're all 90 minutes or less. So maybe if you think you don't like opera, now's the time to, to try it out. Um, also, we have Shakespeare festivals coming up. King Lear with um, Andre de Shields is coming up on June 10th. We'll be describing that. And also the rep, we're really excited. Our first indoor production is coming June 24th. The rep will be at the new Burgess Theater in Co at COCA. Um, so we're excited. And then of course, after that comes the Muni. So I know everyone's excited about the Muni this summer, but. We have a ton, a ton of events in June. So please remember to go to our Facebook page, the Minds Eye Facebook page and mindseyeradio.org and um, check out all the events. So does anybody have any last questions for Tom? Otherwise, we're gonna say good night. Thank you. Okay. Right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> good night.